Thank you very much, Theo. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Mallinson, Chair of the SOAS Centre for Yoga Studies, and it gives me great pleasure this evening to be introducing Professor Carl Baer, who uh, I'm sure doesn't need much introduction to anyone who's been following yoga studies for a while. Uh, Professor Baer is currently a Professorial Research Fellow at the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Vienna, and uh, yeah, has been working on modern yoga for, for many years. Um, his current research interests also include 19th and 20th century alternative religion, mesmerism and psychedelics. I um, uh, And among his many publications, he was editor and also contributed to the volume. It's Yoga in Transformation was the name of the volume, which was the proceedings of a conference in Vienna. It was an excellent, really excellent um, yoga studies conference in Vienna in 2013 which is called Yoga and Transformation, I think. And then the edited volume came out in 2018, which is open access as well, if I remember rightly. So everyone, I mean, probably most people are probably aware of that already. But uh, so, and I'm also really excited about this evening's talk, C.G. Jung on yoga, which is not something I'm particularly uh, au fait with, but I did, did just examine or mark a very good MA dissertation on the subject. So I'm more clued up than uh, uh, I would be. And it's a fascinating topic. And I have lots of questions which may be answered in the process of the talk, but otherwise I shall ask them at the end, but then everyone else, as uh, as Theo said, please put your questions in on uh, Slido. So uh, over to you, Carl, thank you very much. We can't hear you, Carl, I think you're muted. I don't know if... Uh, yeah, no, no, I think you're you're there now. No, no, you, you've disappeared, but your voice is there. And uh, okay. Yes, now I you, can you see me now? Yeah. Perfect. You can see and hear you. Thank you. Okay. And uh, I just uh, opened. Uh, uh, the sh uh, uh, Escape. Uh, just a moment. Ah. What's that? It's beginning to look good. Ah, oh, perfect. Now we are here, huh? Great. Okay. Something's wrong with the. We it was looking okay. Was it just not moving along? Uh, yeah. So and now, ah, now it's functioning. Okay, so. That's it. So thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I'm very glad and uh, grateful for uh, being able to speak in, the, in your beautiful center. Uh, appreciate the whole project very much. And uh, I would like to share some of my thoughts on Carl Jung with you this evening. The Swiss psychiatrist uh, used the term yoga as a general category for all kinds of Eastern religious practices that are concerned with the spiritual development of the practitioner. Jung conceived yoga as a primarily oriental phenomenon. He was not, to quote Leon Schlamm, concerned with distinguishing between the varieties of yoga practices and competing so soteriological perspectives established by the traditions of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism. Rather, he was interested in exploring the universal psychological processes underlying these practices, which are also relevant to the Western mind, although historically the Western mind evolved differently. I will leave aside his reflections on Buddhist yoga uh, and Taoist meditation techniques and uh, theoretical concepts in this talk and focus on his encounter with uh, Hindu traditions. 
For Jung, yoga was almost synonymous with meditation practice. Nevertheless, he knew the psychosomatic dimensions of yoga in the form of pranayama, which he treated only in passing, and especially through the chakras, to which he paid more attention. What we today call modern postural yoga is not covered in his writings. Uh, I will first have a look at the most uh, important stages of his involvement with India and yoga and the major sources of his yoga knowledge. Uh, and then um, I will uh, have a look at uh, Jung's Orientalism. As I just uh, indicated, yoga, Jung's view of yoga is shaped by his image of an East-West polarity, which adopts Orientalist cliches and reinterprets them by means of his psychological theory. Therefore, Jung's Orientalism will be treated as an intellectual framework of his yoga studies. The next section deals with uh, Jung's notion of yoga and his concept of psychotherapeutical Western yoga. And then I close with some uh, concluding remarks. Early encounters uh, of Jung with yoga. The first encounter dates back to his early childhood. When he was not yet six years old, he was fascinated by pictures of the Indian gods Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva in the children's picture book Orbis Pictus. His involvement with Indian religious and uh, philosophical literature goes back to his student days. Uh, when he started medicine. In 1900, he became an assistant of the famous psychiatrist Eugen Pleuler at the Burghölzli, the psychiatric hospital of Zurich. And around this time, he acquired the 50 volumes of Max Müller's famous series, Sacred Books of the East. Uh, the photo uh, you see on uh, the PowerPoint is from Jung's library. And you see all the volumes of uh, uh, Max Müller's uh, Sacred Books of the East. If you look at the right bottom corner, you see a red volume. Uh, this is uh, Woodrow's Shakti and Shakta. And uh, I come back to Woodrow's, uh, to uh, Jung's uh, reading of Woodrow uh, later. So he had all the translations of Upanishads, uh, Brahma Sutras, Bhagavad Gita, etc., uh, Samhitas. Uh, he also studied uh, uh, Deussen's history of uh, uh, Indian philosophy and his works on uh, his work on the Upanishads, Richard Garbe's book on Samkhya philosophy, uh, and Jung's extensive library also included. For example, James Ferguson's Tree and Serpent Worship in India and uh, several books on the history of South Asian fine arts and architecture. In uh, his first book, first major work, Transformations and Symbols of the Libido, uh, published in 1912, uh, he demonstrated that he not, did not only have these books <laughs> on the shelves of his, his library, but also read them. Uh, he was trying to introduce a, a comparative mythology into psychoanalytical uh, thought. And uh, while writing transformations and symbols of libido, uh, he consulted the Zürich Indologist Emil Abeck, so he was in contact with an Indologist. He cited from the Rig Veda and Upanishadic texts, and especially referred to the concepts of Atman and Brahman. In uh, 1909, Sigmund Freud and Jung met, and uh, in 1907, yeah, 
uh, met in Vienna and then collaborated closely for around five years. Both became friends and were very engaged in the psychoanalytic movement. Uh, Freud uh, thought that Jung is something like his crown prince uh, and uh, then he was uh, quite disappointed. Things turned uh, out not so easy with, in their relationship. After 1912, when the book uh, was uh, published, he uh, had a serious midlife crisis that lasted several years. He broke up with uh, Freud and um, had a, a lot of disturbing dreams and visions that he could not interpret. And he uh, gave up teaching at the Zurich University. And uh, during this period, period, he was intensively engaged in imaginative adventures and visionary experiences, which formed the basis of his fama, famous uh, Liber Novus, also known as Red Book. The Red Book, uh, and especially its paintings, contain uh, several references to Indian texts and ideas. For example, uh, the first. Let's see it. Okay. Based on his experiences uh, with the with uh, his dreams and visions, he developed his own kind of meditation technique that le he later called active uh, imagination. And I emphasize this because his practice of active imagination is uh, the practical basis of his approach to yoga. And he always uh, compares yoga with uh, his experiences uh, in with uh, this kind of uh, meditation technique. In, uh, yeah, during this time, uh, he, uh, did some yoga exercises. Um, he he tells us that he practiced yoga while writing the Red Book. And uh, the question is, uh, what the hell did he practice when he said, I'm, I was practicing yoga? I quote Jung uh, from his autobiography. I was frequently so wrought up uh, that I had to eliminate the emotions through yoga exercises. But since it was my purpose to learn what was going on within myself, I would do them only until I had calmed myself and could take up again the work with the unconscious. So this is an important uh, uh, statement. He uses yoga to calm down his emotions in case they get too strong. And uh, the yoga exercises uh, function as a kind of uh, first aid in emotional emergencies for him. The real process, the, con the his uh, uh, explorations of the unconscious are not part of the yoga exercises. The, he only uses them when they get to when the the, the process of imagination and vision uh, gets too strong. What kind of exercises could these have been? Uh, Jung uh, did not have uh, a yoga teacher to instruct him and practically oriented yoga literature was rare on the European market in those days. Um, Sonu Shamdasani refers to a recommendation Jung gave in the 1930s to his patient Fowler McCormick, uh, where he describes an exercise that uh, works very similar to his description of his yoga exercises, he said, um, uh, he writes to Mac, uh, um, uh, Fowler McCormick's uh, uh, reports. Dr. Jung said that in times of great stress, there was a very useful exercises, which was exercise, which was to lie flat on a couch or bed 
lie very still and breathe quietly with the idea that the wind of disturbance was blowing over you. So it's quite possible that Jung practice such an exercise in order to calm down. It resembles me of auto-suggestive uh, exercises from New Thought Yoga in the Yogi Ramacharaka style. So probably he, there were translations of Yogi Ramacharaka and other New Thought Yoga uh, writings. So probably he, he got some inspiration from there. In 1920, Jung acquired Sir John Woodruff's The Serpent Power. Many marginals, marginal annotations in this copy, in his copy of uh, The Serpent Power, prove that he read the book very carefully and uh, Woodruff became the most important source for, for tantric forms of yoga for him. In uh, 1921, uh, Psychological Types were published, the first book after he started his self-experiments with active imagination. It largely drew on insights from his fantasy journeys and their elaboration in the Red Book. In Psychological Types, he introduces the distinction between the ego and the self into his psychology. The ego standing for the center of consciousness and will, while the self represents the center of the wholeness of the human psyche that encompasses the conscious and the unconscious and represents the image of God within the human being. This distinction between ego and self has several roots, one of which is the Upanishadic Atman. In uh, psychological types, he also introduced introversion and extraversion as basic human attitudes into psychological typology and the polarity between uh, the two, introversion and extraversion, also informed his orientalist thought uh, as we will see soon. And he used uh, introversion, extraversion to define yoga. Psychological types uh, provided the basis for Jung, Jung's lifelong conviction that there is a deep affinity between his psychology and in particular his method of active imagination and yoga, which does not, however, preclude important differences. In 1930, Jung stopped uh, working on the Liber Novus uh, and from then on, uh, his most intensive uh, study of yoga starts. Here we have uh, two uh, illustrations from the Red Book that uh, are important for his yoga, uh, for his understanding of yoga. On the left, you have Systema Mundi Totius, which is a, a, a kind of cosmic uh, uh, diagram showing the order of the microcosmos and the macrocosmos uh, and the opposites, the polarities that rule this uh, microcosmic, macrocosmic order. And uh, Jung later said, this was the first mandala I was painting and later, uh, also patience of him uh, through this kind of schemes that uh, remind of uh, uh, South Asian mandalas. Uh, on the right side, you have a, a painting of Jung. Uh, the image language uh, legend is Brahmanaspati. And this uh, Painting belongs to a series of paintings that uh, are connected with uh, concentration and uh, what he calls tapas and the role of tapas in his uh, uh, active imagination method. Uh, Brahma, Brahmanaspati, uh, the king of Brahman, uh, the powerful word, word of invocation that summons the God 
uh, is also connected to Agni, the god of fire. He knew that from Müller's uh, uh, series, and uh, he connected it with his experiences uh, of uh, imaginations uh, emerging because of this uh, fiery uh, concentration he was uh, drawing towards the unconscious, the void, the, the dark. Okay. Uh, so uh, when we speak about Jung in the thirties, we sh and his interpretation of yoga, we um, should consider that uh, he was not the only one who was dealing with yoga from a psychiatric and psychological point of view. There was a kind of discovery going on in the uh, psychiatry literature uh, from the end of the First World War throughout the 1920s. The first one who compared yoga with psychoanalysis was uh, F.A. Winter, uh, a pseudonym. Uh, it was the psychiatrist Frederick Wertham, who published two articles in the occult journal, The Quest, Qu Quest, uh, and, and British, uh, the best uh, British occult journal, edited by G.R. G. H. R. Mead. Uh, a famous uh, occultist, former member of the Theosophical Society. But Winter was only the first one, but an important one, because uh, Winter was very probably known to Jung, because Jung uh, was, uh, had the Quest journal in his library. Uh, and uh, were uh, uh, quite uh, uh, astonishing parallels between the few of yoga that uh, Winter or Frederick Wertham uh, saw and uh, Jung's own few. Uh, Winter compared the Yoga Sutras with the psychology of Freud and Jung, and his approach uh, already anticipates basic ideas of Jung. Uh, according to Wertham Winter, the human nature and the struggle of human beings towards self-knowledge are the same in the East and in the West, and he thinks that this would be proved by the similarity in the symbolic representation of these striving forces within. So similarity of the symbolic representations of the quest, the struggle of human beings towards self-knowledge. This is uh, an approach that is quite similar to Jung's own. At least, um, in uh, uh, civilization and its discontents, Sigmund Freud himself also uh, made some remarks on yoga quite late and not very uh, elaborate, but uh, in between you have a lot of other psychoanalysts like, uh, for example, uh, Franz Alexander, The Biological Meaning of Psychological Processes in 1923, or Otto Rank, The Trauma, trauma of Birth, uh, uh, and others who wrote on yoga and on Eastern meditation techniques. And uh, most of this stuff is what I would call uh, colonial psychiatry. Uh, they want to show that the mental disorders of civilized man uh, is the normal state of mind of the savages <laughs> and the, uh, the non-Europeans. So they are in a kind of uh, daily life, schizophrenia, catatonia, uh, uh, and uh, 
this kind of uh, comparison uh, was very popular and they interpreted eastern meditation techniques yoga and so on through that lens so they saw it as a kind of archaic uh, uh, manifestation of psychic processes and uh, Jung shared this view but he was more on the side of a positive orientalism because uh, uh, you know orientalism always has two sides the one side is uh, we westerners are better and more uh, uh, have more knowledge and technology but on the other side the the, the non-western people have something which we have lost uh, and Jung was emphasizing this part of orientalist uh, thought uh, that India has something to give because it has some archaic uh, approaches to the human mind that we have lost. The heyday of Jung's yoga reception. Um, in 1929, Jung wrote a commentary to Richard Wilhelm's translation of the Taoist text, The Secret of the Golden Flower. In this text, he already uh, touches uh, also uh, questions of Hindu yoga. In 1930, Jung read Heinrich Zimmer, Artistic Form and Yoga in the Sacred Images of India. And this is a, a very important book for, uh, for Jung's uh, yoga reception. Uh, he later met Heinrich Zimmer personally, but this book influenced him a lot. Uh, Jung was fascinated by it because uh, this groundbreaking study, uh, a classic of yoga research, uh, investigates the mandala and the yantra in tantric tradition. And he underlines, uh, Zimmer underlines, that the sacred images are not only artistic expressions of religious worldviews, but have a practical meaning as utensils of religious and magical rituals and tools for visualization within meditation technique, techniques. So Zimmer places the uh, sacred images of India, tantric mandalas, yantras, uh, within meditation practice. That was an important uh, step and Jung could follow him because his own paintings uh, were connected to his uh, meditation practice and he used painting to express his uh, meditation experience on the one hand and to deepen it and clarify it through this uh, artistic process. Between 1930 and 1932, he, uh, Jung lectured on Kundalini Yoga and collaborated with uh, the Indologist Jakob Wilhelm Hauer. It's a difficult chapter. I don't want to go into details now because Jakob Wilhelm Hauer was an ardent Nazi and uh, that made the relationship between Jung and uh, Hauer not easier. But um, at least, uh, it took until 1938 that uh, Jung broke with Hauer. And I think it's quite obvious that in the beginning, he, his attitude towards Nazism was uh, ambivalent. He saw good sides and bad sides. And only uh, after 19, uh, in, the, in the late 1930s, he uh, criticized uh, the, the Hitler regime uh, quite outspoken. In 1933, the first Aranus conference uh, took place and its title was uh, Yoga and Meditation in the East and in the West. That was just a symptom, it's just a, a, uh, an expression of the interest that Jung had because Jung was uh, uh, mentor of the whole Eranus conferences and the focus of the first Eranus conferences was on the east-west relationship and the very first conference was on yoga and meditation. 
Hier habe ich sie äh, Jung und Heinrich Zimmer in 1936. Ein Zimmer also was invited to the Eranos uh, conferences that happened in Ascona in Switzerland. In 1960, in 1936, uh, Jung's article Yoga and the West was published in uh, Prabuddha Bharata, the uh, uh, journal of the uh, Ramakrishna movement. Uh, Jung was invited in uh, 1937 uh, to visit India and uh, then went on a journey for three months to India. Uh, he also met uh, Subramanya Iyer, the a guru of the Maharaja of Mysore, in, with, together with Paul Branton in Zurich in this year, 37, uh, to talk about Indian philosophy and yoga. Uh, in uh, 1939, uh, after his journey to India, he lectured on psychology of yoga and Eastern meditation at the Etihad Zürich, uh, University in uh, Zürich, and uh, high school in, in university. And uh, 1939, uh, he invited Surendranath Dasgupta to Zürich, and uh, Dasgupta uh, lectured on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali at the Psychological Club in Zürich. Uh, Dasgupta, the historian of Indian philosophy, uh, who also wrote a book on yoga as philosophy and religion that was published in 1924, uh, uh, met Jung during Jung's journey to India, and then Jung invited him to speak in uh, Zurich. So this is the overview, because uh, in, during World War II and uh, after World War II, he did not Publish very much on yoga and Eastern meditation anymore. He focused more on uh, Western alchemy and uh, uh, Christian topics. Uh, and uh, so um, the real high, heyday of his yoga receptions are the 1930s. Now, after this overview, I want to get a bit more into the content of his uh, interpretation. And as I already said in the beginning, he, uh, he follows a orientalist uh, line of thought. And uh, I want to have a look at this uh, now. So here we have a scheme that shows how he interprets West and East. The, and you will see quite easily that uh, these are cliches from Orientalist uh, views that uh, he just adopts and interprets it in his uh, psychological way. The basic world view in the West is materialism and in the East, idealism. So the outer world is the real world for the West. The inner world uh, is more or less seen as an illusion and not a true uh, reality. In the, the East identifies reality with the soul, the inner life. The outer world is seen as an illusion. What for the Westerner is real is a dream for the Easterner and vice versa. What for the Easterner is real is a dreamy reality for the Westerner. The power of the West is material, the, that of the East is ideal. Very similar uh, uh, things you can hear from Vivekananda and uh, Actually, I think that Vivekananda is, uh, so to say, the, uh, one of the sources of his uh, uh, Orientalist view. 
the direction of the libido of the attention of the consciousness is uh, extraversion in the west introversion in the east dominant form of knowledge science and technology technological know-how in the east in the west and wisdom thinking in parables and images in the east typical religious practice extraverted prayer and worship in the west directed towards a god in the height in the uh, in the heaven and in the east it's yoga as typical practice self immersion meditation that is a kind of discovery of the god within uh, everything and especially within the human soul and uh this is probably the most in, uh, interesting thing for his yoga reception, the relationship between the consciousness and the unconscious are different. Just have to look at it. Uh, in the West, there is a dissociation and exclusion of unconscious contents under the rule of conscious will. Whereas in the East, we find a connectedness and a, a compensatory relationship between the conscious and the unconsciousness. And the conscious ego is, on the other hand, in danger to be overwhelmed by the unconscious because there is more openness towards this hidden side of the human nature. So his understanding of yoga, here a quote from Yoga and the West, uh, this article from 1936. Uh, yoga was originally a natural process of introversion with all manner of individual variations. Introversions of this sort lead to peculiar inner processes which change the personality. In the course of several thousand years, these introversions became organized methods and along widely different lines. Uh, he gives an example how he imagines this kind of the, the emergence of yoga techniques and methods uh, in one of his writings. He, he tells us the story that uh, an Indian yogi is uh, living in a cave for several months and meditates. And after meditation in the dark for several months, he has a, an insight and he expresses this insight by painting a circle and a square and four directions uh, on the walls of the cave. And later, the disciples of this yogi come and they see, oh, our master had, has painted uh, this circle with the uh, with, with the different directions and so on. Probably this is something uh, which guides us towards our inner depth. So the disciples take the mandala and focus on it in their meditation. And so it becomes a technique shared by uh, many people. And in the course of hundreds of years, uh, systems are uh, emerge that uh, are taught uh, uh, but the source is this individual experience of of the first one who invented a mandala because uh, a, pro, a deep meditation process took place in his retreat so all from individual experience to organized methods this is the the step that is important for Jung, his understanding of yoga as a method. The Jungian two-limbed yoga, yeah, I call it two-limbed yoga because uh, he emphasizes two sides, two dimensions of yoga. Uh, I quote from Psychology of Eastern Meditation, uh, article of Jung, the word means literally yoking, i.e. the disciplining of the instinctual forces of the psyche 
which in Sanskrit are called kleshas. Uh, so uh, the, the work uh, disciplining the kleshas, understanding the kleshas is the first important point. And when, when he is interpreting the Yoga Sutra, he is speaking about the kleshas and of course the Eightfold Path. This are, uh, and especially Samyama, the, the uh, last three uh, limbs of yoga, because that is meditation practice. So this is the first thing. And then uh, the second limb of Jung's yoga, behind or beneath the world of personal fantasies and instincts, a still deeper layer of the unconscious becomes visible, which in contrast to the chaotic disorder of the kleshas is pervaded by the highest order and harmony. So after the uh, disciplining of the kleshas, a deeper order comes uh, uh, to the fore. And uh, this is symbolized by the uh, tantric mandalas, for example. Jungian Tulim psychology. There is a, a, a parallelism between his view of yoga and his view of psychology. He says, true to our European bias, we have evolved a medical psychology dealing especially with the kleshas. We call it the psychology of the unconscious. And our Western psychology has in fact got as far as yoga in that it is able to establish a deeper layer of unity. The mythological motives form in themselves a multiplicity, but this culminates in a concentric or radial order, which constitutes the true center or essence of the collective unconsciousness. In account of the remarkable agreement between yoga and the results of psychological research, I have chosen the Sanskrit mandala for this central symbol. So again, we have these two steps dealing with the personal unconsciousness, the disorders of instincts and the desires and drives, first step, and then a deeper unity uh, com comes to the fore in the process of therapy, as in the process of yoga practice. Okay, so I've already quite spoken quite a long time, but I would give you a, a, a short hint about Jung's understanding of the chakras that might be of interest. Jung understands, uh, understands the chakras as symbols for human levels of consciousness. They are new worlds of consciousness, one above the other. So it's he's interpreting the the chakras as symbolizing different ways of being in the world, lower ones and higher ones. And there is a development from the lower to the higher level. And this is fueled by the Kundalini Shakti, which Jung identifies with his concept of the anima and a divine urge. That's his uh, 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 quote divine urge that drives people to become what they can be and thus realize their true selves. This is, these are the basics, but uh, indeed it's a complicated affair, Jung and the chakras, especially if you look at the lectures he gave with Hauer on the psychology of the chakras, you see that his interpretation of the individual chakras and the ascent through them is based mainly on four sources that are difficult to reconcile with each other. He, he is referring to the translations of the Shat Chakra Nirupana by Woodroff and Hauer. Uh, he uh, is bringing his concept of the individuation process to the descriptions of the chakras. Then he has a theory of three levels, uh, three psychical localizations, the lower abdomen, the upper trunk and the head. And this is basically uh, European tradition uh, uh, from ancient Greece, 
Uh, in Platonic philosophy, we have these three body centers, lower abdomen, upper trunk, head, and Jung refers to that and projects this to on, on the chakras. And he has reports of his patients about dreams and visions of snakes in their bodies that move upwards and that like. So these four sources, he blends and he uh, and he's trying to cope with the, the uh, contradictions that uh, uh, emerge when he tries to understand uh, the descriptions of the chakras in this uh, chakra Nirupana and the other sources he ha has to understand body centers. And uh, you, if, you, if you read these lectures, it's sometimes very entertaining. He's a charming uh, and charismatic speaker, but he contradicts himself. He tries this approach and changes the whole thing, uh, starts all over again and so on. So uh, I don't think that he got, uh, he came to a consistent interpretation of the chakras, but you see the process of uh, trying to understand them from his psychological background. Active imagination as a kind of Western yoga is my last point. He uh, distinguishes between imagination, passive imagination and active imagination. Imagination in general is the self-articulation of the unconscious in diverse perceptible manifestation. So it's not just uh, imagining something by conscious will. If you close your eyes and you try to imagine a unicorn, you might see something, but that's not imagination in his uh, understanding. Uh, if uh, Jim Madison dreams of a unicorn and the unicorn tells him, Jim, I have some new information about Kejari Mudra, you should consider this and that. This is a manifestation of the unconscious. And if it's a deep manifestation, it's a manifestation of the, uh, not the personal unconscious, but the collective unconscious. Passive imagination is a dream, for example, as I just uh, uh, gave the example. The mere perception of fantasies in dreams, daydreams that arise spontaneously. Active imagination is the active unfolding of a imagination in a, a process of concentration, uh, concentration, focusing on it without uh, disturbing the, the image. This is a very difficult technique, but uh, uh, Jung, that's Jung's meditation technique, to let the images come and then focus on them so that they unfold by themselves. And when they, so it's not only that the unicorn uh, uh, comes, the unicorn is doing something. Uh, probably it starts to speak to you. And so this is a process. And uh, also part of the imagination, active imagination is that you answer to the Im images you get in this practice. You can ask them, what do you want to tell me? Why are you telling me this? Why are you so angry about me? And so on. So this a kind of dialogue between the visions and the practitioner is part of the active imagination. The practice of active imagination, here a quote from Introduction to Jungian Psychology. Jung says, uh, by assuming a passive posture at night, while at the same time pouring the same stream of libido into the unconscious that one has put into work in the day, the dreams can be caught and the activities of the unconscious observed. 
but it cannot be done by just lying down on a couch and relaxing. It has to be done by an unconditional surrender of the entire libido to the unconscious. I have practiced doing this. Uh, Jung connects this with the uh, concept of tapas. This is a quote from the Red Book. Set the egg before you, the God in his beginning, and behold it, and incubate it with the magical warmth of your gaze. This is a description of the process of active meditation. And we uh, connected this to, hopla, to the concept of tapas. He said, he says, you have to quote, quote him. So, quote him. Very early, Jung says, uh, very early on, we find in Indian texts the concept of tapas. It is used as an expression to the fructifying effect of attention. Hence, it is translated as creative heat. This translation is from our, he, he refers to prachapati, incubates himself. This is the word used for the technical concentration exercises out of which yoga developed. And this kind of magical, warmth where the, meditation, the, the practitioner of meditation incubates himself, sending his magical warmth, warmth of attention towards the unknown, the unconscious. And uh, Jung says this is uh, tapas, as known in the yoga tradition. The difference between Eastern yoga and Western active imagination. I want to uh, stop with this point, my talk. Uh, yoga as it is practiced now and has been practiced for many hundred years is a system, uh, Jung says. The Western technique is not a system, but a simple process. In the East, it is a technical system. As a rule, the object of revaluation or meditation is prescribed here, which is not in active imagination, where it arises quite naturally from a dream, from intimations that manifest in consciousness in a natural way. So this is the difference. And as Jung thinks that the Western man is uh, suffering under uh, the uh, separation of the unconscious and the consciousness. He thinks that meditation methods that are prescribed to the conscious ego to perform them are not helpful in this situation. He, the, he wants the Westerners to discover their unconscious. And for this, a technical system of prescribed meditations is not useful. They have to open up to the images that come from the unconscious by themselves and work with them. And so that is the reason why he doesn't uh, recommend Indian yoga practices for Westerners. In, basically. If this is so, we can discuss. Uh, it's, of course, part of his uh, orientalist thought is to distinguish between East and West in such a way. And uh, one can doubt if this holds true. Uh, but uh, he also, uh, this should not be this should be clear that he also, with his kind of psychology, wanted uh, to, uh, with a, um, to win the battle between East and West, because 
we Vivekananda came with this, you are materialists and I bring you spirituality. The West is better in science and we are better in the inner science of the yoga is the inner science of the mind. Yeah? And Jung says, is very skeptical about the claims of Vivekananda, but he says our scientific psychotherapy, uh, psychoanalysis is the real scientific approach to the intuitive insights of uh, uh, Indian yoga. And in a way, it's a synthesis of science and uh, meditation practice, what he aims at. And this would be a step ahead with uh, uh, compared with the original traditional Indian yoga. So in the end, uh, I think uh, in Jung's psychology, uh, the West is the winner again, taking uh, inspirations from Eastern uh, yoga, but uh, transforming them uh, with a scientific method that is uh, more adequate for the modern uh, Westerner than the traditional forms of yoga. So. That I think was my summary. And now we can start the discussion. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed, Professor Bayer. That was fascinating. A great tour of a very complicated uh, history. And um, yes, I have lots of questions, but I will try to restrict myself. Um, Firstly, I mean, it seems like, like sort of inferring from what you said, I think I know the answer to this, but it seems as though Jung completely lumped together lots of different Indian systems. He put, he, he doesn't seem to differentiate. I mean, you, you've talked about, you know, the, the creative power of tapas, which is really a sort of Vedic notion. And I think you yes. that was taken from the Vedas and then the, the kleshas and some other terminology from Patanjali and then mandalas and chakras from Tantra yes. systems. And you said he read Woodruff. And does he think that these are all part of one coherent system? Well, this, this is what he seems to, what, well, that, that was what I inferred from what you said anyway. Yes, uh, he doesn't differentiate so much. For him, it's all Eastern yoga. It might be Buddhist or Hindu, it might be Patanjali or the Tantras. Uh, he's not so much interested. He knows that there are different schools, different systems, but this is not uh, what really interests him. Okay, so he sort of essentializes them and, and, and yes. One, yes. One, one system underneath. And then, and he pits that against some sort of essentialized West. So I was wondering also about notions of a, you know, a perennial philosophy. Does he think that there's a sort of underlying system that can, that is, that is true to the, the entire world or East and West, as Kipling would say, where they never the twain shall meet, are they irreconcilably uh, opposed to one another? Yes, I think that um, he has a kind of perennialist view of uh, the process of individuation, becoming yourself, uh, the, the uh, disciplining of the kleshas as first step, and then discovering the gods and goddesses that are hidden in the collective unconsciousness. And in the end, uh, uh, this uh, mysterious center uh, uh, of the mandala, in a way, uh, 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 is symbolized by uh, certain figures that show that there is a deeper center that is transcending the conscious and the unconscious. And that's the true self. And in a way, it's a divine self because it's a uh, image of God within man that is discovered. Uh, this is a process that happens everywhere in the world. And there are many cultural differences that uh, emphasize this side or that side, but uh, the underlying processes are the same in Jung's view. Okay, and in, in that case, and if you said that ultimately he... he... One... Sorry, one second, Jim. Um, Carl, could we ask you to 
stop your screen share and then we can uh, oh, see you okay. full screen would be brilliant thank you sorry jim i didn't want to interrupt no, but, uh, well, thanks you're well spotted sorry i was too too involved um, you too. my final just final question before we've got we've got one on the slido um would be are you still oh here we go yeah well done um yeah. great um final question would be then in which case, if he ultimately argues that the his Western system is better than this essentialized Eastern yoga, um, what would you say that he actually gained from studying the Eastern essentialized yoga? Would he? Would he? Did he? How did he benefit from looking at it? Do you uh, think it actually did then change his system in any way? Yes, I think so. Um, I think he he. He, um, he took his own discoveries more serious, seeing parallels uh, in other cultures. That's one point. And the mandala is was a topic that was uh, around. He paint, painted this kind of circles and, and squares with squares and so on and center. Uh, and his patients did. But uh, I think that to, it was... Uh, not arbitrarily that he called it mantra, uh, mandala. He, it was he he felt the importance of these uh, uh, structures uh, better via the Indian forms and via Heinrich Zimmer's book on artistic form and yoga. Yeah. Uh, that concerning the chakras, Sonus Shamdasani says that. Um, uh, Jung learned something from the chakras in regard to the topography of the unconscious, but I haven't checked this. I, I haven't found it. Uh, actually, I uh, I don't know if this is right. But he uh, he, he had a, a, a I think the basically his theory has problems with the body uh, and uh, the localization of psychic uh, contents uh, is something that he knows, but he is not able to articulate it. And he was searching for uh, ways to better understand this. And the chakras uh, looked like this is an elaborate system that he could connect with, but it, it, there are many difficulties. Uh, and actually, uh, his interpretation of the chakras was not very successful in the sense of uh, influential. The, if you look at uh, the Western chakra systems after Woodrow, uh, the impact of Jung is, is not, not very strong, I would say, because it's too difficult and not elaborate enough. Uh, not something you can consume easily. You can study it because you, I learned from that, that the difficulty to interpret the chakras from an external point of view. I mean, you can reconstruct the meaning of the chakras by looking in the tantric uh, scriptures and uh, interviewing yogis. But what does all this mean yeah, uh, for a Western psychologist or uh, a philosopher. This is a different question. And it's not so easy to interpret the chakras uh, beyond the reconstruction of their historical meaning. So, and this, the difficulties you can study in Jung's approach. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Now we have a few questions on the slide. I think, first of all, um, if we can go to Philip de Slip, who has uh, oh. uh, a, an interesting comment or uh, suggestion to make. So if we can go to Philip, please. Herr Bayer, uh, hold on one second. Oh, I uh, feel it. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to bring up Yogi <laughs> Ramacharaka. So, the most is, influential yogi of the 20th century, your world. <laughs> I, I would agree with you. Um, maybe one of the few. So in chapter 23 of William Walker Atkinson's book, Hatha Yoga, uh -huh. he describes, because he's new thought, he says that when your mind is angry, your body will be tense. The two are connected. Uh -huh. So he recommends laying down 
flat and kind of doing like a deep relaxation of like letting your whole body feel heavy. Um, and he gets this technique from a uh, hypnotic healer in Chicago named Herbert Parkin. And so there's a, at least in my mind, it's famous. There's a photo of Parkin would have his patients lay down uh -huh. on a table. And his idea was in this relaxed state, they were able to be suggestible and treated. And there's a photo of a young Atkinson in the crowd watching that. So that might be perhaps a likely source of, of Jung's relaxation yoga of yeah. laying down and, and doing that. Yeah. Lots of this kind of exercises were around during the 20s and 30s already in Germany also. Yeah, and uh, Ramacharaka Atkinson is one of the possible sources. Yeah. All right, thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Philip. Um, and next, if we can go to Lubomir Ondraczka, please. Lubomir, are you there? Now I should be. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, great, thanks. Uh, I have two simple questions. First, um, you described Jung as a, let's say, positive orientalist who, who was looking uh, for uh, some lost heritage in, in the East or, or India. And uh, I wonder whether he, he uses or recalls the idea of Aryan race when, when doing this uh, because of his contact of uh, Jakob Hauer and, and, and others. So whether at any place, whether this, this common idea, this common heritage uh, oh. uh, is uh, invoked by, by Jung. So this is my, my first question. And the second uh, is about uh, when, when uh, mentioning the sources, uh, uh, I was surprised not to see uh, Mircha Eliade's name. So I wonder whether he was uh, aware of the early, I suppose that he was, of the early uh, Eliade's book on, on yoga, I mean, published in the 30s, because you mentioned that later he did not, uh, uh, did not uh, write on yoga uh, uh, anymore. So the later uh, Eliade's uh, books, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, he, he did not use. But, but about the, the, the early books from, from, from the uh, 30s. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes. First to the first question. Um, well, I don't. I did not find any uh, quotation of Jung where he is uh, linking with the Aryan Germanic uh, uh, myth. How I was doing that? Yeah, yeah. But of course, yeah. Uh, Jung. In, in his in this early 30s distinguished between the Germanic unconscious and the Jewish unconscious mm. that was a very mm. uh, uh, very strange uh, phase yeah? and he later gave this up yeah but this distinguish distinguishing Germanic and a Jewish uh, uh, soul uh, nature is not connected with yoga at all. Yeah. And uh, the Indo-Germanic myth is uh, uh, people who, who think in this line do not um, expose the differences between East and West so much. We are, we are not Easterners and Westerners concerning India. We are Indo-Germanics, Germanic people and have a common culture. This is the, the uh, idea behind this Indo-Germanic uh, ideology. Uh, and this is not Jung's line of thought. He draws a distinction between the East and the West, not based on race, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but on cultural historical differences. I haven't found it, uh, anything else in, in Jung. Probably there. Concerning Iliade, there is a they have an, had an exchange of letters, uh, but I think only after World War II, mm -hmm. quite late. Uh, and uh, when I remember rightly, then uh, Iliade sent a new edition of his yoga book 
to Jung. And Jung responded to that. And Jung felt misunderstood. <laughs> so, uh, so there was not much communication then between the two. Mm -hmm. So you think that in the, that in the thirties Jung, Jung was not aware of, uh, no. of Eliade's work? No. Oh, that's that's surprising. Okay, maybe he was, but I haven't found uh, a reference in Jung's uh, writings yet. Mm -hmm. Probably there is one, but I don't know. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Now we did have a well, we've got a question from Alexander Fadeyev, but I'm afraid Lubomir's preempted it. That was about Eliade, so we've um, had that one asked. Now we've got one more. We've got an anonymous question, so I'll read it out. Uh, uh, what do you think Jung's legacy has been for the trajectory of modern yoga? Hmm. Hmm. Difficult to say. Uh, of course, he, he pushed the popularity of yoga in uh, psychotherapeutical circles. And uh, the impulse to take yoga serious from a psychological point of view as a kind of psychotherapy, as a kind of uh, method to gain uh, your inner center, to discover your inner center. That was something uh, that had an impact, I would say. But he was already in the 30s, he, he was, uh, to say, uh, against the grain in, in, his, in his very uh, impulsive and strict uh, opinion that for Westerners, it's not good to practice Eastern yoga. And of course, he didn't have this, his, the historical knowledge that we have. For him, Vivekananda was a representative of pure traditional Indian yoga. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is to totally, yeah, of course, we know better now, but uh, he was against the, the the enthusiasts of uh, yoga practice in his uh, circles and that was of course also a kind of boundary work uh, in favor of his own psychology because what he what he said was i'm doing better i can offer you what the yogis offer but more fit for the western mind so i my yoga is the better yoga so that was in the end uh, what, what his message was. And uh, okay, that was of course limited to the Jungians. <laughs> Others were not so uh, amused by this uh, message. <laughs> of course. Well, I, I have a related question because I quite often get asked about how in some modern yoga circles, the chakras are associated with, with particular emotions and, and yes. states. And as far as I know, there are almost no precedents for that within the Indian tradition. There yes. is there's this one text, the Sangeeta Ratnakara, and we, Mark Singleton and I put a translation from that section on the, the, the section in, on the chakras in that text, because there is some mention of sort of, sort yeah. of emotional states. But as I understand it, Jung may be responsible for that. Am, am I correct there? Or uh, Yes, he was one of the first, but not the only one. Okay. And in the 60s, 70s, uh, they, they projected models of the human mind and stages of the human mind from humanistic uh, uh, psychology. Uh, Maslow, for example, yeah, with the peak experiences and the basic needs, yeah, and this kind of pyramid of human needs from very basic material needs to the highest spiritual uh, uh, realization. So this kind of uh, um, models of the human being were projected on the chakras. And it's Jung tried uh, a very similar thing. Hmm. And I wonder where, so, but that was coming purely from him then, presumably, that was his creation, his No, I don't think so. I mean, sorry, the, the, the other people around about, but they didn't have any Indian source for that. that was... No, 
No, probably he was the first one who really uh, engaged in a study of, of Woodruff uh, from a psychoanalytical point of view. So this, he was probably a pioneer in this direction, but not very influential because the, the results of his research were not so clear, uh, not an easy formula. Uh, so. Great. Actually, one we have one last quote. If you don't mind, we're a minute over. But if we can go to that, just one final. Yes. I think I, I my guess is it'll be a short answer. But if we could go to Radha Devi, please. Hi. Thank you so much. Sorry for my ignorance on this, uh, Dr. Carl. Um, I don't know much about Carl Jung. I'm definitely um, a great master or psychotherapist. But now that I've been hearing and listening to you. I have to. I have several thoughts. Is he trying to, during his time in and out of the Western, Eastern mind frame, was he trying to run away from Indian yoga, or did he feel he just wasn't up to it to spread or make it very authentic? And in that same context, did he or Oxford Diksha or initiation, or did uh, any of the gurus he met want to initiate him? Thank you. Hmm. So running away. Mm. <laughs> running yes, away. it's a hmm. Yeah. Uh, there is um, there is a whole discourse in uh, among the uh, young scholars uh, about uh, 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 one question: Why didn't he meet Ramana Maharshi when he was in India? Because Heinrich Zimmer was a, a kind of follower of Ramana Maharshi and. Uh, very fond of his teachings and his person. And he recommended it to Jung uh, that he, sh when he goes to India, he should meet Ramana Maharshi. He did not. And he said uh, afterwards, he gave comments like, uh, I didn't know what to learn from this man. It's always the same what they are saying. And so on. it's more kind of uh, protecting himself for not uh, he didn't want to get in touch uh, with Ramana Maharshi and uh, found some strange reason for that. But the whole, when he was in India, he was really, he had, uh, he had a lot of problems in coping with the Indian culture and um, was not really interested in uh, deeper contact. Uh, also afraid of what, whatever, I don't know. Uh, I feel some fear and insecurity and uh, in him when he's speaking about uh, his uh, experiences in India. So he was not interested in getting into it really. Uh, and he was not also, he was also not interested in uh, finding a guru to teach him meditation or something like that. No. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, that's it for questions. Thank you so much, Professor Bo. That was absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I could uh, keep quizzing you more, but um, yes, our time's run out. So uh, okay. I, I, well, thank you personally, and then I'll hand back to Theo for, the, for our final sign off.